Remind me of the name of that song. Be Unto Your Name. Yeah, we need to sing that, okay? So write that down. All right, it's a great song. All right. Uh, I just wanted to also say before we get started this morning, we, we lost a, a guitar player, and so uh, they uh, kind of scraped around to the bottom of the barrel to find one today. And so uh, I thought I'd help out a little bit, but uh, I'm not going to make that a, a, a weekly thing, so you all be praying about that, all right? All right, uh, like to do it, but uh, I don't need to do it all the time, but glad to do it. All right, <coughs> as we get started today, uh, you, you, may have heard, you maybe have heard this phrase, it's kind of an oxymoron, healthy arguments, healthy arguments. Now, I don't know if there's such a thing, and yet there is such a thing, healthy arguments, uh, unfortunately, w- in this day and age that we live, it's, uh, we don't have a lot of those. Anybody notice? It's like we're going to war with everybody who disagrees with us, or vice versa. And so we don't have a lot of those. When I was up in uh, Chicago uh, a couple weeks ago, you know, a, f- a friend of mine, David Bennett, who now lives in Maryland, we were going to school in Chicago at the same time. We saw each other in Atlanta at that WCA meeting. And while we were there, we were talking about some common friends that we have in Steve Rankin. Some of you know of Steve Rankin and and another guy named Kevin Baxter. And so when we were up there, those guys would argue tooth and nail. I mean, they would just get after it. And I called them healthy arguments. They love to argue theology and doctrine and all these things. Not to get after each other, not not, not to demean one another, but just to argue, to argue the points and so forth. And it, w- it was kind of fun just watching them do it. But they were never out to get each other uh, like people are today. And so, I don't know, I told the first service folks, I said, I don't know. You know, this, maybe this sermon is just for me. Because uh, just in my observation of seeing what's going on in, in our world, especially in our nation and in the life of our church, our denomination, there's just some stuff there that just seems to be jumping at me. And I thought, okay, I'll just... I'll just talk about some of this today because we we had Thanksgiving last week, we have Advent next week, and so I'm going to give you some of the where's the beef piece here today with with what I'm talking about uh, as we we move forward here in in a passage from 1 Peter here shortly. I was was going through some things and I came across this article, and I, I just, I never read the elite daily, for one, I'm not elite, and I can't read all that stuff anyways, but I mean, there's contributors that always write for the elite daily, and this guy named Francisca Giugino, yeah, we go way back, but anyways, uh, he, he wrote, he read an article, he referenced this article that he read, and the article was entitled, The Thing You Should Never Talk About, and what was written in the article, it says this, everyone should just avoid the possibility of starting an argument by never speaking about politics and religion politics and religion i mean if any of you did that at thanksgiving you don't have to worry about a large crowd for christmas all right right so so this guy goes on to say based on the article that he read he said this is the problem in our society rather than having the discussion about things that really matter and are imperative to the progress and stability of our country we refuse to acknowledge the problems for fear that our opinions will be disproved or that someone will be offended by what we say. Say it isn't so, but that's what's going on. And in reality, if you think about that, I, I thought about that article, I thought about some of the things I'm going to share here shortly. And, and, you know, America has lost the ability uh, to have a civil conversation. Anybody notice? You, you, there, there's no real such thing as a civil conversation conversation, especially when, you know, we have a couple different uh, viewpoints. We've lost the ability to separate the person from the issue, and so we have an attack of a person rather than an attack of, of the understanding of the issue, etc. And so, if you disagree with me or I disagree with you, at least based on this, I'm attacking. If, you know, if Stan and I disagree, I'm going to attack Stan rather than just attack his Santa hood, Right? <laughs> I didn't call you out last week, so I had to come back, brother. <laughs> that's why you come. Thank you. And I know you won't walk out, so that's good. But anyways, I mean, you, you know what I'm saying. We, we, we attack the person rather than, than the, the issues or whatever. And so people get all offended. Man, we are such a bunch of wah We get all offended. 
People are too afraid then to say anything because somebody's going to be offended. Or the flip side of it is, is people are not afraid at all. And they're going to really tell you, and especially if they're behind a keyboard, they will say whatever's on their mind because they are really tough when they're not looking you in the eye. Right? And so I begin to look around, and you know this is a fact, but there is very little difference in how people respond to one another in the, in the life of politics as well as in the life of the church. People act very much the same way, sadly. And I have some good friends, and Justin knows what I'm talking about here. He and I travel the same circles. But we have some good friends, some good friends, some peers in ministry who write and say the most hateful and accusatory things to, whom, to those whom they disagree. And it's like, dude, I mean, I've called some of them. I've, I've me- I don't do it publicly, but I, I, I'll message them. I say, look, what, what are you doing? I mean, why did you say that? Because that's a reflection on who we say who we are as Christians, and especially as those who maybe come from an, a more evangelical background, all right? Because there already is enough finger pointing in that area. And so people li- who, who will come across that way, they're, they're seen as very pompous and, and holier than thou and, and very arrogant and flat out nasty. And so what happens is non-believers pick up on it. Anybody notice? Non-believers have eagle eyes. They see, they watch for any little oops that you might do, you as Christians, as believers. And if you oops, they're going to nail you for it. They are going to nail you for it. Oh, I thought you were a Christian. Yeah. And so they, they pick up on these things, and then they go, why, why would I want to be a Christian? Why? And it's a good question. It really is a good question. Part of the reason, uh, this is part of the reason that there's hostility towards Christians. And friends, I'm, I hate to tell you this, but it's just going to get worse. It really is as we, as we move forward. And so to use one of my favorite words, which is what, Stan? Behoove. Thank you very much. It will behoove us. I'm glad. It's always good to have a guy I can count on. You're like a calculator. It would behoove us to take a look at Scripture from 1 Peter 3. We're going to look at 8 through 16, okay? 8 through 16. And uh, there, there's a few points that I want to lift up that come out of this, okay? Now, now Peter is writing. He's writing to a, a very diverse group a, a dispersed group uh, of those who are being uh, persecuted in a variety of ways. And he's been talking to them about how it is that one should live. And this is kind of where we find ourselves in this section of, of the text in First Peter. <clears throat> and so he's picking up in the conversation, and he says, finally. Now, I've learned when I say finally, everybody gets to paying attention real quick. Well, this is him saying finally, not me. All right? So finally... All of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. And then he quotes from the Psalms, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Don't you just hate that part? I mean, a way? Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared. Here we go. To give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Okay, well there's a whole bucket load of stuff in there. We're going to get to a few, a little bit of it. And I've, instead of three points, I'm going to bless you with four today. How do you like that? We don't have anywhere to go, it's snowing. So... No, I promise. We'll move it along. Four points, separating, preparing, reasoning, and responding. So the first point I want to look at is that of separating. Now, Peter is writing 
to, as I said earlier, this dispersed group, the diaspora, they call it, the dispersion of, of especially uh, to, to the Jews who had came to, to place faith in Christ. But then it goes beyond that, that, that Peter is also speaking to Gentile believers as well, based on other things that you read within the text. And so we see it's a very cosmopolitan audience as he writes to these who have placed their faith in Jesus, who are living, who are seeking to live as Jesus would ask them to live, and yet are facing hostility, are facing persecution, these kind of things. So there's verbal and physical persecution. There's growing hostility, as I said. And Peter is writing this wonderful letter of encouragement, of challenge. He's reminding them of who they are. He's reminding them that they are a people who are called out to be different, different than others, separate from others. Now, you know, y'all know I grew up on a farm, so, you know, we had a sorting pen. And a, and a sorting pen was a place where we'd bring in the livestock, whatever it was, and we'd run them uh, down the aisle, and we had a sorting gate where we'd go left or right. It's like a sheep and the goats type of deal, you know? So we'd sort them out, all right? And so he's saying here there's a sorting that takes place between those of us who proclaim to be Christ followers, uh, and there should be a difference between them or us and others who, who choose not to. Within this, he's talking about a lifestyle, a conduct, a way, a, a way we treat others, a responding to the treatment, and so forth. There should be something different about who we are as Christians. He even goes on to say in other passages here in, in 1 Peter that we are resident aliens. Resident aliens. It's kind of a strange phrase, but that's what we are. Um, citizens of another country. We, uh, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. You know that song. All right. Well, so there's this calling in verses 8 through 14, which I'm really not going to spend time there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with more uh, of these uh, later verses. But even the, the passages before of what I read today deal with how it is that we are to live our lives. We're called to be holy, which is a big deal for me and, and should be for you, and righteous. Holy and righteous. And this same language now is used when we get to verse 15. Verse 15. Now notice it says this. But in your hearts, revere or set apart Christ as Lord. Now, this word in the Greek is, is hagios. It's, it, it means holy, all right? Hagios. And, and that means to be, of course, set apart means to be regarded as sacred, it means to dedicate, it means to sanctify, uh, to separate, to make holy. Which is interesting that you make holy the one who is holy. That's kind of cool. Uh, that you set apart the one who is set apart, that being Jesus. But we're to be set apart as followers of Jesus. That we're to be different. There's something that identifies us as different. And if you notice, it, in our hearts, in the very deep seat of our emotions, into the depth of our guts, is what the word is in Greek, is, is that from the very depths of who we are, we are to set apart or revere Christ as Lord. Now here's why we're in trouble in the church these days. Not just Methodism, but I mean the church universal, at least in America and in the West. The importance is this, that Christ is Lord, and nothing or no one else is Lord. Okay, are you with me so far? That Christ is Lord, Jesus Christ is Lord, and nothing, no one else is Lord. You see, whatever or whoever masters you is your Lord. I mean, I didn't write the book telling you what's in it. Whatever or whoever masters you is your Lord. And the crazy thing in our day and age, you've heard this before, everybody wants a Savior. We all want to be saved, but nobody wants a Lord because then that, we have, that means we have to submit to the Master. We have to submit. You know, I surrender some. And that's where we get ourselves in trouble. And so there's this, this submission here. Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. And so therefore, we must begin with Christ as Lord or we will never reach the divine destination. And I'm not just talking about, oh, let's, let's just worry about getting to heaven, which is a great thing, by the way, but that there's a part of the journey that we're on right now that we live out about being a set-apart people 
a sanctified people, to live as Jesus would have us to live. Okay? And so we do that as Jesus is our Lord. Otherwise, if you think about it, what's the point of the rest of this? What's the point of, of almost anything, really, if Jesus isn't our Lord? Why, why do we want to follow him if he's not our Lord? Many do it for convenience sake. You know, it does look good in the obituary to say you were a member of a church, at least. You know, but ultimately. So, that, that pre- separating thing is extremely important as we start, and it moves us to this preparing piece. The second point, preparing. Notice what he says. Always, not just when you feel like it, but always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Now, boy, there's a, there's a, there's a bunch in there. To give an answer to everyone. Be prepared. Be prepared. Now, if our answer is built upon a starting block of anything other than Jesus is Lord, then that is not hope. That is just merely wishful thinking, all right? Cain talked about hope a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, whatever it was, about hope. And uh, if we're going to just talk about something that's a starting point where Jesus isn't involved in it anywhere, well, then it's really more about us than it is about Jesus. And then, therefore, it is more about deception. It's more about dishonesty. It's more about false advertising. And ultimately, it leads to destruction. I talk about ditch to ditch. We end up in the ditch. So Peter says to the, to the listeners, the readers, and to us today, he says, we are called to be prepared. Be prepared to give an answer of the hope that you have within you. Now, it's another Greek word here, and we'll just put it up here since we're doing a Greek lesson this morning. But uh, hetoimos, okay? I know you all got up this morning and said, man, I hope he talks about hetoimos. Mm, man. But it means this. It means to be ready or stand by. Stand by. That means there's a preparedness there. You know, John Woods was sitting up here in the earlier service, you know, military and all. There's a, there's a, a be ready. Because if, if you're called into action, you are ready to go. You're ready to serve. And the same thing is for us in the life of the church. To be prepared. It's, it's to be ready to meet any opportunity or challenge that is at hand. Now the deal is, we must be prepared if we're going to do that and it's a word that has to has to do with us being proactive all right proactive and that's why you know many of us in light of all the stuff that's going on out there in the life of the church but even way beyond that there's a call to be proactive you don't want to be caught you know not knowing what's going on when you're reactive you will end up in the ditch because reactive means you're re, there's, it's reactionary, but being proactive means we're paying attention to the things that are going on around us in the life of our local church, in the life of the larger church, in the life of our community, in the life of our families, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right? So it's proactive. And, and many times we want to blame the church for, for not being, having people ready, but let's back up and think about this, families. Families. We have a role as families not to just dump the kids off and say, church, take care of them and teach them. Right? And so we, we have the role in preparing our kids as they're being raised and grandkids, etc. <coughs> Oops, wrong side. I forgot to move the pack over here. Uh, see, I want to move it over here. But uh, those of you in internet land, just, just don't worry about it. It's okay. Um, but anyways, the, the family is important. The church is important. We're all important. And unfortunately, all of us have failed along the way so often to not prepare ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, so that when it comes time, uh, there isn't a response. We don't know what to say. We're not ready. Uh, And so then when it comes time to being able to articulate our belief, we don't know how. We don't know what it is that we believe. We just know that we go to church, and and I know that we, let's see, we did say the Apostles' Creed in the 8 o'clock service. Darn, I wish I'd have been there so I could remember what we believe, you know, or whatever it is, and those kind of things. So it gets in our way. There's a lot of people that if, if we were to ask, can you articulate your faith, you'd get the deer in the headlights look. And so we must be, must be prepared. I remember one time doing a, a confirmation class. I did this at Leota. I don't know if I did it with Eugenia or not, but I did this out there, and I did this in several other churches. And, and I've, uh, what I did was in the class afterwards, I said, okay, I want you to go down the hallway while all the adults are, you know, drinking their coffee and eating their donuts. And I said, you go ask them these questions. Tell them Pastor Rick made me do this. 
So just blame it on me and just go, okay, uh, Pastor Rick said I can't pass this class unless you define grace. So I need to know what grace is and, and what's mercy and what's, it, what's does salvation mean and, 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 and what does sanctification mean? Wow. Should have been, it, it was embarrassing. It, they came back with all these answers. I thought, man, we've got to go back to 101. It was embarrassing. Now, I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to have you stand up and say, well, share with me your understanding of grace. You should be able to do that. But, um, you know, this is an area we've got to work on. To, if, if, uh, if the non-believer wants to know, why, why do you believe this, what do you say? Or what do you believe? What do you say? So it's important. There's a preparation that's involved. And, and so it's like, it's, it's like the language in a courtroom where the, the judge is calling out, hey, can I get a witness? Can anybody share with me? Can I get a witness? Sometimes there is not enough evidence based upon how one articulates their faith to uh, convict a person of being a Christian. That's a little scary. Can I get a witness? Here's the third point. Reasoning. Okay, we're moving along. All right, everybody all right? Reasoning. And again, kind of this courtroom language. Uh, and if, you know, if you've ever been a lawyer or a defense attorney especially you know there's that need for a ready defense and and the word here is is this in greek apologion where we get the word apologetics how many have heard that word apologetics okay apologetics is not about apologizing about being sorry for something apologetics means a defense of something and in this case a defense of the faith of what it is that we believe so it means this a well-reasoned reply or a thought-out response And this is to adequately address the issues that are raised. A reasoned argument. Now, let me ask you this. Any of you know anybody out there that just likes to argue for the sake of argument? Uh, You don't have to point across the aisle or at anybody you're sitting by. (laughs) Husband and wife, I see you over there. That's funny. You should see what I see. It's funny. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's just to argue for the sake of argument, and we get ourselves in a pickle, and it's like, okay, why are we doing this? What's the point here? And, and you know, we, we get ourselves in trouble through all of that. Uh, but what we're talking about here is not to argue for the sake of argument, but to be able to articulate in a, in a healthy argument, okay? To lift up the hope we have within us. You know, people want to argue, and then what happens these days is that it leads to conflict, and then it leads to hateful speech, and then it leads to fighting, and oh man, it's a lose-lose. I mean, it just is. It's a lose-lose. It leads to uh, really this, this point, this last point of the day, this important point, and this is kind of the difficult one, really, because this is the actual living out of who we are called to be as followers of the one whom we set apart as Lord. And it's this responding. It's the point of responding. You know, the reasoning, and I'm not talking about that we have to be all great scholars, great theologians. We all are theologians, by the way. I mean, we all have a thought about who God is and what we believe about God. But uh, I'm I'm not talking about the depth of knowing the Hebrew and the Greek and all that kind of stuff. But there's some things that we do need to know to be able to share and discuss with one another. But this point of responding is, you know... I don't, let me ask you this, and Cara, you don't have to answer because you worked with me for a while, all right? So, but the deal on is, is this, uh, sometimes the sanctifying process takes a little time to take hold. Anybody relate, you know, honestly? Yeah, it just, yeah, it takes, a, you know. we're called to be better now than when we were a year ago, five years ago, Ten, as far as where we've grown in our faith. But there are some days, right? Gina, you know what I'm talking about? There are some days where we just want to smack somebody in the name of Jesus. It's a holy smack. Greet each other with a holy smack, right? It's biblical in my Bible. <laughs> now, we've got to be careful. But, I mean, it's just one of those things. And, and so, you know, I think back sometimes to the good old days, whatever those really are, and how I used to respond. And here's how I used to respond on this picture here. Remember that point out that out Western Kansas? Yeah. Uh, I have a I have had a Clint Eastwood theology in my past, and even sometimes when Susan makes me mad now, 
No, somebody told me not to pick on you so much, but you can take it. But I mean, you know, there's those times where, you, you know, uh, the, good, the good turns into the bad and the ugly. And so you just want to respond in that way because they deserve it. And I, it, it's righteous anger. Jesus turned a table over, so am I, on your head, you know. But I mean, that's kind of how we, let's just be honest, it's how we feel at times when things happen and, you know, you get accused of things, whatever. Now, let me just tell you this. I'm way better than I used to be, and my wife even uh, vouches for that, right? Here's the 20 bucks again. (laughs) But I mean, you know, there is something to the sanctifying process over the years. And so now, maybe I won't be so quick to say or to act in ways that I would have done five, ten years ago. All right? That's good. So the, it's not, a, not the best recommendation to, to pull the Clint Eastwood Colt 45 thing. You know, when I was out in western Kansas there at the men's Bible study, Craig Shepard and a bunch of those decided they, that I needed to listen to a song that best described me, and it had a Bible in one hand and a Colt 45 in the other. Yeah, yeah, the traveling preacher or whatever. But it's better. It's better, it's better. Still working on it, though. Peter says there's a better way when giving an answer when we respond to these things. And he says this, but do this with gentleness and respect. And then I put my response, ugh. (laughs) You know, do this in gentleness and respect. Now, you know, there are times when we are falsely accused. And you don't feel like being overly gentle. There are times when people say and do hurtful things to us. You know, and, and again... There are times when there are those who are out to get us. I've shared with some of you before, I had a meeting uh, within this last year with a group of folks, and about five, seven minutes in, I finally asked the one guy, I said, I said are you just out to get me? And he said, yes. And, and so what do you do? I mean, uh, that's kind of a hard way to have dialogue, you know, have the conversation. There are those who seek to slander. In other words, speak evil in order to destroy. Uh, some people like, like that. And, you know, that's not who we are called to be. That's, what, that's what, not how Jesus called us to live. We may feel that way, but that's why you don't base your theology off of feelings. The, the, your feelings, your emotions are the caboose of the train, not the engine. All right? Your feelings will get, in, get yourself in trouble. And so Peter says to answer with gentleness. Now, this isn't some little milk toast type of thing I'm talking about. And this isn't like Susan when she was implying that I might have said this a week or two ago. But it's not like when I actually do say, we're not going to gather around, grab hands, and sing Kumbaya. That's not what we're talking about. The little warm fuzzies. That's not what we're talking about so much here. In the Greek, the word means this. It means gentle strength or gentle force. This word gentleness. And the, the phrase means that the force is productive. Now, let, let me tell you, here, you know, many of you know that I, I like to go deer hunting. So I've got this compound bow. And if you have a compound bow, you know, it takes a little grunt and groan to, to, to get it pulled back. But there's this force. It's this, and, and if I see a deer, I don't want to just go like that because it's going to scare it off. You, you want to go slowly. And it's a gentle force. And you get past that breaking point and you can hold it. But I tell you what, when you release it, there's power, there's strength, there's force. And so we're called to have this gentle force so that when it comes time to articulate, when it comes time in our preparation to share, to reason, that we have the strength behind us because of the work of the Holy Spirit as well in our lives. Okay? See, there's something about deer hunting for every sermon. (laughs) So just so you know. But uh, it's a power with reserve and gentleness Uh, The other word is actually meekness, but it's not wimpiness. That's not what we're talking about. And so for the believer, gentleness begins with the Lord's inspiration and finishes by his direction and empowerment. Dunamis, the Greek word, power. It is a divinely balanced virtue that can only operate through our faith. And here's the deal. If our faith is is not deep in Christ, we're going to be Clint Eastwood people. I'm just going to tell you from experience. And so as you deepen your faith, you can remove that and let, let him take over and lead and guide so that it can be a gentle force rather than just a s- holy smack type of thing. It says gentle strength or gentleness and respect. 
And this Greek word is phobos, where we get the, weird phobia, the word phobia or fear. Uh, but it's not a fear in the sense of being scared or afraid. This is a, a, is, is a different type of word in the context that has to do with respect. And when I thought about this several times the past few days or whatever day I've been working on this, you know, uh, phobos, meaning fear, all of a sudden it, it appeared to me that maybe this is more about a fear of humiliating someone or degrading someone. I don't want to do that. I mean, I, I don't want to do that. And so there, there's something like that that plays into it at times, I believe. And so it's a dignity that's offered to those who are more often than not those who don't deserve it. And then I realize that's me. Anybody? We don't deserve what Jesus did on the cross. We don't deserve that at all. It's purely his grace and mercy that he died on our behalf. We didn't deserve it. Didn't deserve it at all. So our response to all of this ties into our behavior of how we act. That way, when it's all said and done, then our conscience can be clear no matter the attacks. I've told people this. I told the 8 o'clock folks this, too. I, uh, when people have talked to me in the past couple of months or whatever about certain things that might be going on, I'll say, listen, listen have you been obedient to the Lord? Have you done what He's asked you to do? Have you been faithful? If so then lay your head down on your pillow and close your eyes and know that you have followed what he wants you to follow. And let, 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 the, let the pressure go on him because he says, I'll take it from you. All right? Because then you can lay down and go, okay, I did what was asked of me. Sometimes I don't like it because that's not my natural state. But because of you, Jesus, you helped me get there. And so I, I want to conclude today with some practical application. So uh, for those of you in the, in the, on the praise team, uh, kind of maybe work your way up here. But um, it, it's always the good to be able to have some practical application to what it is that we learn. And if we're going to do these things, if we're going to respond, if we're going to have preparation uh, in such a way to be ready, if we're going to um, be able to share the reason for the hope that's within us, first, first, first we need to pray. Be a people of prayer. And I'm not talking just about the arrow prayer, you know, just the arrow prayer that goes up and hits the ceiling and bounces down. I mean, it's some time of prayer and saying, God, you know, prayer is just an honesty of conversation, really, to say, God, you know, I really can't do this. This is not, this is really not my DNA. This is really not how I normally feel. And I, hey, boy, if you don't help me, uh, I'm not going to get her done. So it's a prayer. And there's confession within that. There's acknowledgement within that. And, and there's, a, there's the work of God in that. Reading and meditating upon Scripture, of course. I mean, that makes sense, but, you know, we can have the book, but we get a lot of dust on the Bible in a lot of people's places. We know that. And so we've got to open the book. We've got to spend some time in, in, in reading and meditating and, and let God speak to us through His Word. Because he, speak he speaks to us in a variety of ways, and one of those is in prayer and in reading of His Word. And to let Him speak and, and then to look at some of the examples as we read, we go, oh, wow, they went through the same thing, and... Boy, that response wasn't very good. That's like me. And then all of a sudden, that response was really good, and that's who I want to be, and some of those kind of things. To be intentional. That's a word that I like to use, to be intentional about, about our being prepared. If we're not intentional, if we're not intentional about being art, be able to articulate, then, then how are we going to be able to help somebody who's, who's in need to hear a word of hope? To be intentional and to be real. Don't be Rick Just. Be who you are. All right? That was an amen spot for you. But, uh, I mean, be who you are. Be who you're called to be. I mean, uh, everybody has a different response. I, I, I confess my Clint Eastwood theology from time to time. But you may be somebody totally different, and you are. So who are you, and how do you respond? I'm an extrovert. You might be an introvert. What, how, how do we do that? But be real. Care. All right? Really. I mean, it, it matters that we care for people. And that we invest in them just as Jesus has invested in us. You know, uh, in Proverbs it says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So, you know, there's enough anger out there. No reason to stir up more. Know and listen your audience, to your audience. Uh, who are the people that you're around? Who are the people asking questions? You know, somebody's going through this. 
while somebody's going through this. This group's going through this. I mean, your answer might, may be different. Now, it's going to have the core being the same, but your response is, is to pay attention to uh, who you're speaking with. You know, I've said this before. We exegete our community. Who's our sphere of influence? Those types of things. So how is it that we can speak to those that we're with? So listen, pay attention. And then, and then lastly is this, is to know this, that Jesus can relate. Why? Because he's been there. He's been there. He's been falsely accused. He's been called names. He's been called out. He's been spit upon. He's been mocked. He's finally been put on a cross. All of these things. He's been there, done that. And we can look to him. And you know what? He was prepared, though. Because just as he told the disciples, he said, on the third day, this is my word, baby, I'm going to rise again. <laughs> on the third day, I am going to rise again. Let's be resurrected people in the sense of being prepared to give the answer for the hope that's within us. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge today. We thank you, Lord. Uh, you know, this is kind of one of those sermons that jumps in between a bunch of things, and we kind of wonder where'd that come from, but uh, I'm grateful that you uh, put it in front of us, because we all need this. Uh, we all need to be able to respond and be able to be prepared for uh, the reason that we have a hope. So let it be that we'd be intentional in, in sharing that hope with others. Help us by your Holy Spirit to give us the words we need when we need words, to give us the, 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 the mouth that is shut when it needs to be shut, to give us the, the ability to do what you call us to do. Let it be so, Lord, that we'd follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.